we're richly blessed that our God, our Master, our Father, has given us his living and powerful and inerrant word. From his word, we learn about the character of God, God the Father, and God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Through its pages, we are able to hear what God revealed to his servants and to his prophets, to Abraham and Noah and Moses and Joshua and Daniel and Isaiah and Ezekiel and Matthew and Paul and many more and to us. We learn about God's attributes and why he created us and what he expects of us. We are taught about salvation through the appearance and sacrifice of the Messiah. And in the New Testament, we are taught through the very words of our Messiah. God manifested in the flesh and dwelling among us, Jesus Christ. Jesus addresses how we may live our lives. How we may live our lives as his servants and his children. How we may live our lives in a manner that is pleasing to him and that brings him glory. He adds summary and clarity to our relationship with the law that God gave Moses. For God gave Moses Ten Commandments. And then in the book of Leviticus, we read of 613 more. But Jesus, but Jesus, when asked what was the greatest law, summarized them and clarified them. In chapter 22, verses 37 through 40, Matthew records Jesus' answer to a, a, a doctor of laws. Of course, it would be a lawyer who asked him this, a lawyer with ulterior motives, actually. Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first in great commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God. You shall have no other God. You shall make no carved images to worship you shall not take the Lord's name in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath and love your neighbor. Honor your father and mother. You shall not commit murder, nor commit adultery, nor steal, nor bear false witness, nor covet. We'll look this evening at Jesus summarizing and clarifying our righteousness vis-a-vis -vis God. And now, I just love this when Pastor Bill allows me to speak, allows the Holy Spirit to use me. Love these words, favorite words. Please, let's open our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Chapter 5, verse 20. And let's go before the Lord in prayer, please. Almighty God, we come here just in awe of you, for you are perfectly just and perfectly righteous. 
for you are holy on earth and in heaven and at the same time you are perfectly merciful and perfectly loving lord we come to honor you because you are our god who is all powerful and all knowing and present everywhere we come to you because we are sinners asking for your mercy because we are weak longing to be made strong in you because we are poor asking for the richness that only you can supply so Lord instruct us and teach us and cause our hearts and minds and ears to be open tonight and let us come away from this place more knowledgeable because the fear of you is knowledge and wiser because the fear of you is the beginning of wisdom and stronger in your word and better able to follow the path which you willingly lead us on unto glory in Jesus name Amen. So Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verse 20 of Matthew chapter 5. For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Mm. Jesus' disciples came to him as he had gone up to a mountain, on a mountain, and there he taught them. He taught them of the great blessings and happiness we have come to call the Beatitudes. He taught them that they were to become salt and light to the world. He taught them that he, the Son of God, did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. But then Jesus said something. He said something that must have absolutely blown their minds for he then said for I say unto you that unless your righteousness exceed, shall exceed that of the scribes and Pharisees you will in no wise enter the kingdom of heaven now that must have come as quite a shock to his disciples. Because as far as they were concerned, no one was more righteous than the scribes and the Pharisees. Because that's all these men lived for. To be righteous in their own minds and in the minds of of all those around them. And these men were constantly displaying how righteous they were by the types of robes that they wore, by the types of borders around their robes. You can see in a synagogue today, the more holy of the Jewish folks who go there have more a little purple uh, uh, Boy, I'm at a loss for words. That seldom happens. <laughs> you know, they go around saying, well, I have more tassels on my thalus, so I'm more holy than you. And the Pharisees were experts at this kind of display. And just by their actions, the Pharisees had special 
little actions in their prayers, which they intended to really indicate a tremendous depths of righteousness. And they prayed on the sidewalk. Maybe not so much to God, but so everyone would think they're righteous. Sad to say that in most churches in this day and age, in this country, we have Pharisees. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 24, he accused them of straining a gnat. Why would they strain a gnat? Because the law said you shall not eat anything with blood. And so you'd see a Pharisee coming down the street, standing on the corner, putting his finger down his throat and gagging. And then straining and pushing and trying to throw up. You'd say, what's wrong? Oh, I was running along and this gnat flew into my mouth. So he strained to get rid of the gnat. Because, of course, he didn't want to meet, eat any meat that wasn't kosher. You know, I don't know, in kosher butchering, you... You bleed the animal. I mean, you, if, if you want a really tough, flavorless steak, I suggest you go buy some kosher beef. And, you know, not all the onions and mushrooms in the world are going to make that thing edible. But I don't know how you bleed a gnat. You know, I, but Jesus used this as an example. You strain a gnat. But now Jesus is telling his disciples that they have to be more righteous than even this. And Jesus is saying, hey guys, if you aren't, you're not going to enter the kingdom of heaven. You're not going to go with me to spend eternity with my father. So how could that be? How could he possibly make a command like that? I mean, he's right. He's right just because he's Jesus. And he's right because, just because he's Jesus, and it's recorded here. So how can that be? The Pharisees were so scrupulous in keeping the law. And remember, they considered the law the Ten Commandments. The 613 Levitical commandments and more. If any of you who've worked for the government, you know that there are laws that our Congress passes. And they may be short little things like a thousand or two thousand pages long. But then they get to the folks who write the regulations from the law. And those mere couple of thousand pages turn into volumes on your shelf. Uh, Lee, Lee's a retired bookkeeper and uh, an accountant that she worked for. Whenever, whenever the Congress would pass a tax simplification act, he'd just go like this, job security. Because it wouldn't just be, you know, a couple of foot tall bill, it would be shelf upon shelf of books. And then opinions upon books. And what does this have to do with the Pharisees? I invite you to read the Talmud. The Talmud is a book of Jewish biblical commentary. And on any given Levitical law, you will read, and Rabbi Hillel said, Yada, yada. But his grandson, the great Rabbi Gamiel, said, yada, yada, yada. You know, it's, it's, there were a lot more than the 613 laws. But these folks tried to, to adhere to this legalistic interpretation of pleasing God. And they did it 
because they were self-righteous and self-centered and longing to be viewed by everybody else as more holy. And, I li- and, and Jesus didn't care for these folks a whole lot. I mean, if you call somebody a whitewashed sepulcher, it's, it's not complimentary. And it continues. In Jerusalem, in an Orthodox Jewish neighborhood in 1992, there was an apartment burning to the ground, but the fire department was neither called nor allowed to intervene because the Orthodox Jews had to ask a rabbi whether it was permissible to allow a fire to be put out on the Sabbath. It took a half hour for the rabbi to respond. And he said yes, it was permissible, even though there were electronics involved and the interrupting of current, turning the electricity off to the burning apartments, uh, could be interpreted as work, which you're not allowed to do on the Sabbath, but you know, go ahead and, and let the firefighters put the now three burning apartments, put the fire out there, three burned. Even today, uh, there are hotels that you can stay in in Israel that on the Sabbath, all the meals that you can get at the hotel have been prepared the day before and are served by uh, Arab Muslims. The elevators stop on each floor because pushing the button is interpreted as work. And the lights are always on. The toilet paper is furnished pre-torn little baskets. Modern day Pharisees. A lot of work to be this righteous in your own mind. But Jesus told his disciples they had to be more righteous. For there are a lot of people today in the Christian church whose actions are great within the church, who donate money and donate their time to the church, but their attitudes stink. For what they give isn't isn't in an attitude of service, an attitude of serving the Lord, an attitude of using the gifts given to us by the Holy Spirit to advance the body of Christ. They're used so that people will say, Well, isn't Jim a wonderful guy? I mean, look at all he does for the church. And if you're not aware of all he does for the church, just ask him. He'll tell you. So a person can be doing an abundance of work. A person can be donating an abundance of money. But it's the attitude. It's the attitude that counts. God is for, far more interested in our attitude and what's in your heart than your outward, your outward actions. In fact, he tells us. He tells us that if the work we do gets us rewards on earth, Maybe they won't in heaven. But if we do those works with only God knowing, with no self-interest involved, with no selfishness 
involved, expecting nothing other than to please him who has given us, who deserve hell, salvation, that we might enter heaven. That's what we need. That's the way we need to be. People have been interpreting the law to govern the actions of man. Where God intended the law to be speaking to the attitudes of man. Thus, in the way they were interpreting the law, they were able to fulfill it. Now think of this. The Pharisees, these very righteous men in their own minds, interpreted the law in a manner that they knew they could fulfill by themselves. And I think we all ought to check our hearts to see if that's the way we interpret it. Because we are able to do whatever it is that we do only through the Holy Spirit of God within us. But yet, yet Jesus tells his disciples that if they aren't more righteous than the scribes and Pharisees, they won't get any part of the kingdom of heaven. And sometimes we're so busy trying to be legalistic that we forget that we're in this love relationship with the Lord. That we are helpless before the Lord except for the strength we get from the Lord. And you can't fool God. The Pharisees should have and we should remember that God is omniscient. He sees our outward behavior, yes, but he also knows our inward motivation. We read in 1 Samuel 16, 7, For the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Jesus gives an illustration of how God sees the difference between self-righteousness, outward compliance with the law, and those whose attitudes reflect humility and obedience to God. In chapter 18 of Luke's Gospel, verses 9 through 14, and he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be troubled, will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And as you see Jesus making the contrast, he shows the original intent of the law. And thus, as we see the original intent of the law, 
We are all made guilty before God. For the original intent of the law is to be the schoolmaster, showing us that there are none righteous, none righteous in the eyes of the Lord. The prophet Habakkuk said it this way in chapter 2, verse 4. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him. But the just shall live by his faith. And Paul wrote to the Galatians in chapter 3, verse 11 of his epistle, but that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident, for the just shall live by faith. The Holy Spirit, writing through both the prophet and the apostle, cite faith, not works, attitude rather than self-righteous actions as the ticket to justification. For we aren't saved by our works. We are saved by and only by Jesus Christ and him crucified and risen. We are saved unto works. We are saved to be doers of the word and not hearers only. We are saved to serve our Lord and others in the name of the Lord Because, because this is what the Lord wants. And he kept us from hell. And he allows us to go to heaven. And he allows us, as James says, to count it all joy when you fall into various trials. And he washes us clean. And he gives us the peace that passes all understanding. Faith is a gift of God, and through faith we obtain the grace obtained for us by Jesus Christ on the cross at Calvary. Paul, writing it to the church in Ephesus in chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, of this epistle. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Yet here are the Pharisees boasting of their own works. And here's Jesus telling us that unless in, unless our righteousness exceeds that of these scribes and Pharisees, we will no wise enter the kingdom of heaven. Though the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees was impressive by human, by human observation, it could not prevail before God. In Isaiah 64, 6, it's described this way. But we are all like an unclean thing, and all our righteousness are like filthy rags. We all fade as a leaf, and our inequities, like the wind, have taken us away. We can exceed their righteousness because our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees in kind, not degree. Paul describes the two kinds of righteousness in Philippians 3, verses 6 through 9. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the Spirit, rejoice in Jesus Christ, and have no confidence in the flesh, though I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone else thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe 
of Benjamin, the Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless, but what things were to gain to me, these I have counted as lost for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith. So then we are not made righteous by keeping the law. When we see what keeping the law really means, we are thankful that Jesus offers us a different kind, a true kind of righteousness. Jesus interprets the law in truth because Jesus is truth. Matthew 5.20 shows us, Jesus shows us, the true meaning of the law. But this isn't Jesus against Moses. It's Jesus against the false and superficial and self-aggrandizing and self-serving interpretations of Moses. In regard to the law, the two errors of the scribes and Pharisees were that they both restricted God's commands and extended the commandments of God past God's intent. For our righteousness is not at all about us. It is all about what Jesus Christ has done for us. The only righteousness available to us is that imputed by Jesus through his sacrifice on the cross. Just as our Father in heaven is perfect, if a man could keep just what Jesus said in today's passage, he would truly have a righteousness greater than the scribes and the Pharisees, the very thing we must have to enter God's kingdom. But there is only one man who has lived like that, and that is Jesus Christ. God created us to be in a constant state of fellowship with him. He gave us free will that our relationship with him might be one of choice. But we have chosen sin, and that sin has separated us from God. God has given us the law as a schoolmaster to illustrate the pervasiveness of our sin and the futility of trying to live a life pleasing to him on our own. It shows us to be on our own both helpless and hopeless. Martin Lloyd-Jones said of this disease, which is sin and its resultant separation from God, he, us, may multiply his wealth and possessions, he may perfect his educational facilities, he may gain the whole world of wealth and knowledge, but to do so will profit him nothing so long as his relationship with God is not right. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son 
that whoever, whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God wants us saved because he loves us. Because he wants a relationship with us. Because of his grace for his glory. It is God's nature to forgive and forget our sins. God told Isaiah, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us contend together. State your case, God says, that you may be acquitted. Folks, this is what Job prayed for. Wealthy Job, who lost everything. His health, his children, his possessions, his servants. And he prayed to be able to contend with God, to be able to find out from God what he needed to do. But we're blessed because we live now and we know what to do. Because God humbled himself to become man. Because God humbled himself to go to the cross to die for us. If no one in the world had sinned other than me, Jesus would have gone to the cross. Think about this. Throughout Scripture, we're given Jesus as an example to how to love to love each other, how a man should love his wife. When we preach certain portions of scripture and we talk about men being the spiritual leader of the house, there is a caveat. We are to love our wives as Jesus loved the church. And that means sacrificially. And to say Jesus didn't know what really would befall him flies in the face of the prayers at the Garden of Gethsemane when he asked his father if at all possible to spare him from that cup. To spare him. Remember, he was fully man. He had laid aside his deity. So when he was whipped, the pain from the flogging was felt as any of us would feel, feel it. When the crown of thorns was put upon his head, sharp thorns, he felt it as you or I would have felt it. When he was spit upon, when his face was beaten so badly that he was no longer recognizable as either himself or indeed a man. He suffered that willingly as a man. And when his hands and his ankles were nailed to that cross, and that cross was put upright when in order to get a breath he needed to force himself into a upright more upright position scraping his ruined back against the rough 
wood of the cross and then exhaling and feeling that same back rubbed again. He did that. He chose to do that. He suffered that as a man. And when all of our sins, all of us here, every sin we have sinned in our lives and will sin in our lives was placed upon those shoulders the Father God the Father Jesus suffered the Father turning his face away because of us feel righteous now But we are told that Jesus willingly did this because he loved us, because he wanted our sins to be forgiven. Jesus suffered this because he wanted fellowship with you, and with you, and with you. Is that love? And Jesus is our Lord. We obey what he tells us to do. He's our master, so we obey what he tells us to do. But he is our example. We are to love sacrificially. We are to give of our time, and our treasure, and our emotions sacrificially and what has Jesus done for us he has imputed his righteousness the righteousness of God to us no greater gift and he's patient with us because every one of us live in a sinful body, sinful flesh. We live in a sinful world, a world where, as in these end times, we see sin not only committed, but flaunted. A world where the legislature of a large state gave a standing ovation to infanticide. But we're told to be aware of the season, that no one knows the day or the hour, but we are told to be aware of the season, a season when good is called evil, and evil is, because, is, is called good when there's a great falling away. And yet we are saved by love. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So how could those disciples be more righteous than the scribes of the Pharisees? How could they get their ticket to heaven punched? No way that they could do so on their own. No good works. Not even any humility. But God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So friends, if you now do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, if he is not now 
the Lord of your life. If you have not turned to Jesus for salvation, come to him. Come back to him. Because now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. Go to him. Kneel before him in your heart. Confess to him that you are a sinner. Tell him you need his help, that you want to repent, you want to turn from those sins. Thank him for what he's done for you and ask him into your heart and your life as your Lord and Savior. And if you do that, you will be one who has more righteousness than the scribes and the Pharisees. Please let's pray together. Oh Lord, we thank you for our salvation. We thank you, Lord, for your great patience with us. We once again ask you to have mercies on all of us who are sinners. We thank you and praise you that through your shed blood we are washed clean. And we pray, Lord, that you would use us to serve others in your name, that you would use us to do all that which is in your will, and that that might bring you glory. In Jesus' name, amen.